Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out on um, what is starting to be a snowy morning, at least as I was walking in. Um, I want to welcome everyone uh, to today's event, uh, a conversation with John Carlin about his new book written with Garrett Graff, Dawn of the Code War, America's Battle Against Russia, China, and the Rising Global Cyber Threat. I'll have more to say about John in a minute. He can brace himself accordingly. Um, but first, I want to thank the co-sponsors of today's event, the Reese Center on Law and Security and the NYU Center for Cybersecurity. Uh, these two um, institutions are, I think, a great example of the type of collaboration um, that I'm so pleased to be a part of as distinguished senior fellow here at the law school. Um, I also want to take a moment to especially uh, note and uh, the presence of and welcome um, Rick Reese, who is here with us today. Um, the Reese Center on Law and Security was recently uh, renamed last fall uh, in honor of the family of Rick and Bonnie Feldman Reese, um, Rick's late wife, both of whom are graduates of the law school and longtime uh, friends of the law school. And uh, Rick's generosity and his leadership have been absolutely integral to the work uh, here of the center. And we are just so uh, pleased and grateful uh, for that support and really want to thank him for being here today. So thanks very much, Rick. I also want to thank Rachel Goldbrenner, the executive director of the Reese Center on Law and Security, um, and the team at the center for putting this together. Sovereign Arts Bakhtiar and Alex Potokarvu, um, who uh, are responsible for um, making sure everything's working here and getting us all together. And finally, Randy Milch, um, who's the co-chair of the Center on Cybersecurity. Thanks for being here. Um, and finally, I want to welcome back uh, the alums who are here in the audience, uh, as well as the current uh, members of the current student body. I am especially uh, appreciative of the fact that I see some of my students from my um, seminar that I taught last fall. It's amazing that they're here, especially since the grades are all, have already been submitted. So <laughs> thanks for showing up. And a note of welcome uh, really to the prospective students, who I think uh, some of whom we have in the audience. This is the type of timely discussion uh, and interdisciplinary discussion that you can expect uh, if you come to the law school. So um, welcome to you guys as well. Um, now, finally, I, I'd like to joke that since I've left government, um, I think I'm the only person I know who's not writing a book. Still time. Yeah. <laughs> and so I've learned a few things about how to promote a book. And so I'm going to help John along here. First, you hold it up a lot. <laughs> OK. Then you weave the title. And you need a shorter title to execute on this. But uh, you weave the title into any answer. Would you like some coffee? Yes. And it's great to drink it with Dawn of the Code War, right? Um, and then finally, you ha the most important thing is to remind people that indeed the book is for sale outside. Um, so please, if you haven't gotten a copy, noted uh, that it's out there for sale. Uh, OK, now to the main event. Um, I, we are honored to have with us today John Carlin, uh, who has written this terrific book uh, about an issue that is central to security and law uh, today, the global cyber threat, how we should think about it, how we should respond to it as a nation, as a government, as a society. Uh, it's got profound implications, I think, for our structure, uh, legal and policy. Um, Full disclosure, John and I go back a ways. So in introducing him, I feel a little bit, not just like I'm reading a familiar bio, but I'm doing a little trip down memory lane. So um, to start off with, of course, John is the former Assistant Attorney General for National Security at the Justice Department. Um, and that is where he uh, and I worked together when I had the privilege of leading that division. And when President Obama nominated John to succeed me in that role, um, he had already had a distinguished legal career. 
uh, in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of Columbia, where we were federal prosecutors together. Uh, and then, of course, later he would go on to a number of roles in the Justice Department and at the FBI, honing his expertise in prosecuting and investigating uh, cybercrime uh, and being a real, frankly, visionary in uh, policy issues when it comes to cybersecurity. Today, John is the chair of the Global Risk and Crisis Management team at the law firm of Morrison and Forster, uh, and he leads the Cyber and Technology Program at the Aspen Institute, where I am lucky to get to continue to work with him as I co-chair the Aspen Cybersecurity Group. So it's great to have him here to discuss this book on a topic that seems to be never-ending in its ability to command uh, headlines and push the boundaries of debate, legal and policy, and, and uh, geopolitically, uh, actually, which we'll get into. Um, and we've been reminded of that uh, again this week. Um, so let's, let's kind of get started, uh, John. Uh, let's kind of jump right into it. Uh, you and I both do some commentary on TV now and again, me for CNN, you for CNBC. So we're often asked to comment on news of the day. So I'm lucky I get to turn the tables now and fire away at you on the news of the day. So um, folks will have seen the headlines this morning about the announcement yesterday uh, of the Justice Department about the indictment of Huawei, the Chinese technology and uh, phone maker, largest, I think, phone maker in the world, um, and its CFO. Um, put that in perspective for us, John. Um, talk to us about uh, what you think is important, what should folks know and understand about that, and kind of put it in perspective uh, for the issue we're talking about today. Great. Well, and thanks for hosting me, Lisa, and to be here at NYU. I think being in a, in a setting of lawyers is appropriate for the new type of war that we're in, Dawn of the Code War on sale now. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm practicing. As I've been doing this with Lisa, somewhat making fun, I have forgotten on numerous occasions to mention that I've either written a book or what the name of the book is, which is not apparently appreciated when you're, uh, when you're uh, selling a book. Not somewhat making fun, <laughs> affirmatively making fun. <laughs> but the, uh, call it a code war, it's different <clears throat> than the Cold War, but that too was a war that really wasn't uh, a traditional conflict under international law. But we are in a low intensity conflict and we're seeing in particular from China and have been for a while, uh, vi real victims. So the theft of information that's putting businesses uh, into bankruptcy, that's stealing trade secrets and intellectual property, the use of equipment in order to gather intelligence, but also equipment that can be disabled in the event of a conflict. So it's a form of leverage as we become more digitally dependent that in the, in the event of a conflict, we need to worry about our core infrastructure. And we're also seeing that uh, companies, businesses have been responsive to taskings. I give that as the, as the background for what we're seeing in the headlines today, which is Huawei. Uh, two things are going on today, both of which I think emphasize the role of lawyers and also the role of law in the American system. So we have uh, charges against Huawei. Uh, and if you look at the content of the charges, you see several things. One, that they've been indicted and alleged to have committed trade secret theft, and that that uh, occurred over a period of years, and that they were targeting T-Mobile, so another uh, multinational corporation, and that there was a concerted conspiracy or effort, including guidance to employees on how best to steal the intellectual property. So not something that occurred by a rogue employee, but something that was directed and put forward by the company. And those charges are out of C uh, the Seattle U.S. Attorney's Office. Secondly, you see that they have also been indicted for evading the sanctions regime. So this is a regime that was set up to prevent the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and other, uh, and other types of uh, technology, dual-use technology, to countries. Then this is sometimes called lawfare that are, so it's not an armed conflict, but countries that have not abided by the world's rules or norms, like Iran, um, and in an attempt to prevent them from getting certain technology, rules were put in place, and you're seeing that not only was there a concerted attempt to thwart these rules, and we've seen this before with a major Chinese company, ZTE, but they laid out in detail in the indictment, so-called talking indictment or speaking indictment, they could put some of the evidence in, 
how there was a concerted effort once they knew they were under investigation at the highest levels of the company in order to obstruct, so delete evidence, move witnesses outside the range of where they could be, uh, interviews could be conducted. And they specifically go through, um, for those who are interested in the digital space, how it looks like they attempted to delete inaccurate talking points uh, from a computer, from a laptop, that were recovered and are put, uh, put forward in the indictment. So you have the proliferation on one hand in one set of charts, you have trade secrets in another. And then you have uh, an announcement as we speak by the heads of our intelligence community in a, uh, in a routine that's really unique to the United States, which shows the accountability of our system. So you have our intelligence chiefs speaking in a public forum conducive to an oversight mechanism that dates back to the church committee and abuses that were uh, committed in the intelligence community. And they're saying factually, here's what we think the threats are to the United States. We won't talk about all of them, but what's interesting and uniquely American about that, uh, what's occurring as we speak, is that they are saying things that are inconsistent with the policy and political desires of the current regime. And Lisa can attest from when she was President Obama's uh, advisor, that's not unique to now, <laughs> because they're tasked with doing their best uh, assessment based on what the facts and evidence are, and then delivering it to Congress, even if it's not convenient. Um, so they're saying things as we speak that are inconsistent with what our commander in chief has said about North Korea and Iran, and they're doing so in the form of this national intelligence estimate. What they are also doing, though, in that same event is talking about how China has exploited or sought to exploit Huawei, the telecommunications commit, uh, equipment that could be the foundation for so-called 5G, the next wave of wireless technology that could connect not just our devices for the communication of information, but things, uh, including smart cities. And they are saying that that's being exploited for intelligence purposes. I emphasize that because at a time where some of our institutions are under attack uh, at the Justice Department or FBI uh, internally, while we are also trying to fight a code Code War, where adversaries are using uh, our vulnerability in cyberspace to attack us, I often get the, asked the question, why don't we attack back through cyber means? And we'll go into this in more mm -hmm. detail, but the fact is we moved over a 25, 30 year period to take almost everything we value from books and papers, from analog, to move it to digital space and connect it through a medium that wasn't designed with security in mind, the internet protocol. We've been playing catch up in terms of what the risks are, but right now we're more vulnerable in that space than any other country. And so when we're in a Cold War, whether it's China or Russia or North Korea or Iran, Striking them back where we are most vulnerable may, may not make a lot of sense. Like we, were, we contemplated this, and we'll maybe get into this a little bit later, when North Korea attacked Sony Motion Pictures, people said, well, why don't you knock North Korea offline? The fact is, all of North Korea probably has fewer IP addresses than NYU, mm -hmm. fewer internet protocols. So knocking them offline wouldn't be an effective deterrent. Strike your enemy where they're weak and you're strong. Where are we strong? I would argue that one of the places where we're strong is the credibility of our legal system. The reason why it matters that we brought these criminal charges through Seattle, through the Eastern District of New York, is that it's known around the world that our prosecutive entities and our law enforcement agents are not responsive to the political taskings of whoever the current leadership is. Mm -hmm. That they operate independently and that they pursue the facts and the law even when it's inconvenient. And similarly, as our intelligence community leaders are testifying today under oath and saying things that are not uh, desired by the current uh, administration for policy reasons, they too have a certain credibility that comes from the fact that there's this oversight and when they're called to account to testify that they have to do so and they have to do so neutrally and objectively. That is why you have countries around the world enforcing regimes that are still relatively new, such as arresting the chief financial officer of Huawei when she traveled to Canada pursuant to extradition charge around counterproliferation. For 20-something years, other countries thought of counterproliferation as a political issue, not a criminal justice issue. And painstakingly, through case after case, we've been able to make the argument that no, this really has, this has nothing to do with whatever's going on with trade or tariffs or other issues. This is an arm that's going to operate independently. 
And what we're starting to try to do, and it was a regime uh, a, a change that began in the last administration, is say we can apply that same type of thought to cyber, that outside of whatever is going on in terms of politics, that law enforcement agents, intelligence analysts are going to look to see if you're violating certain norms, such as targeting private companies to steal their intellectual property. If they are, we're going to start making it public, and we're going to start uh, imposing consequences like through our criminal justice system. So let me present two things that, uh, a few things that you said. I want to go into the, the threat picture that you alluded to. But first, can you just talk to folks about um, taking today's or last evening's uh, announcement about the Huawei indictment as an example, is that something that um, this audience should view as unprecedented? Is it, why, why is it so, you've given us a good kind of primer on uh, the context here, but is this, should this be seen as an outlier? Is it part of a, a, a continuing approach here? Give us a, a sense of the perspective you would put it in. Yeah, so to back up a little bit, I used to be, uh, so I was a line prosecutor and I ended up specializing in computer hacking and intellectual property uh, cases. And when I was prosecuting them criminally, um, the uh, round 05, 06, 2005, 2006, I would work with a, a great squad at the FBI and they were a squad of criminal agents. Occasionally, one of those agents would switch squads over to the intelligence side of the house. And when they did, they disappeared. They went behind a locked, secured, compartmented door. And as a criminal prosecutor, I just didn't see them again. Didn't really know what, what had happened to them. And even when I was coordinating nationally the criminal prosecution of computer hacking and intellectual property cases, I still did not know what was going on on the intelligence or national security side of the house. In fact, it wasn't until uh, Lisa brought me over to work for then uh, relatively anonymous director of the FBI, Bob Mueller, um, and later became his chief of staff, that the door opened and I could see what was happening on the national security intelligence side of the house. And what we saw was a staggering, uh, it was an amazing feat of intelligence collection. So I literally could go watch, and there was a giant jumbotron screen. It was a great uh, uh, for the computer uh, GUI or graphic user interface. So I, when I say watch, I mean I was literally watching on the screen as China in particular, Chinese uh, state actors would hop into places like universities, go from the universities into corporations, and then we literally watched a, a visual enactment of billions of dollars worth of intellectual property, trade secrets, trade negotiation strategies, leaving the United States. So that's not easy to do. So it's great work by uh, national security agency, CIA, FBI, working together to pool this information to create that real-time portrait of what was occurring. But I think you'll uh, uh, agree with me, it didn't feel like success to be able to watch it, uh, right? So it, it, was, it marked a change, I think, in terms of intelligence. There were, there were reasons why most of the time when it came to state secrets or national security, the default was to keep secret what it was that you were learning. Very much in the Cold War, the strategy was, let's say, and this was a, a case that later got disrupted that led to the Americans uh, that occurred while we were both there, which was, uh, and was brought out of New York, which was, you know, there'd be, say, illegal Russian operatives placed inside the United States assuming the roles as everyday American citizens. And the strategy during the Cold War is, well, once you discover that, don't disrupt it necessarily. Wait, watch, spend the time slowly to see what it is that they're doing inside the United States. Maybe you can feed some of these operatives fake information to cause confusion to the, the adversary, learn about their tactics, techniques, and their methods. And that, that approach worked when the threat was relatively small and highly trained operatives inside the United States. The shift that we were seeing visually was that it had become asymmetric and what we were seeing was occurring on a scale that had never occurred uh, before and we weren't learning that much. What we were learning is the former director of National Security Agency, Keith Alexander, uh, called it. What we were learning was that we were watching the greatest transfer of wealth in human history. Uh, occur digitally. And so we needed to switch from a mindset of watching the intelligence collection to disrupting it. So when I went back over to the Justice Department, one of the uh, things we we're trying to do is how can we restructure to disrupt these threats and not watch them? One of which was empowering U.S. attorneys in the field. 
So training uh, as national security cyber specialists in every single U.S. attorney's office. So on the one hand, they knew the bits and the bytes, the Electronic Communication Privacy Act, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. But on the other hand, they knew SIPA, how to protect classified information and use it in a court proceeding. And they were read in for the first time to that room that I was never let into to see what the intelligence was. And the FBI issued an edict that said share, just like we do in terrorism, with this new specially trained cadre. And that led to the first case of its kind, to your question, in 2014, so still relatively recently, the indictment of five members of the People's Liberation Army, a specialized unit, 61398. And that unit targeted private company for the commercial gain of competitors overseas. And as we put forward in the case, and it was controversial at the time, there are some who still uh, I think it's the wrong approach to take this public or use the criminal justice system. But what we showed in the case is this is not traditional intelligence collection. They are doing things like Westinghouse is about to do a joint venture with a Chinese partner. And the night before, they're going to lease uh, a lead pipe. So they're going to get paid for a lead pipe, not a national security secret. We watched as these uniformed members of the People's Liberation Army hacked into their system and stole the technical design specifications so they wouldn't have to pay for the pipe. Or to use another example in that case, uh, this is a US subsidiary of a German multinational. It was a solar company. And we watched as these Chinese state agents went in into the unprotected part of the system, email. They watch people discuss pricing, and they figured out, OK, this is the, the point at which if we price under, uh, under where they, this point, we can drive this company out of business. And they did exactly that. And then, to add insult to injury, and for all the budding lawyers in the world, when they sued for unfair trade practices, they stole the whole litigation strategy as well. <laughs> so this is, uh, and when I talk sometimes about what we're seeing in terms of intellectual property theft, there's, a, there's another case where, um, and this was not, uh, uh, this, this was used a thumb drive, but it wasn't cyber name, it wasn't a hacking case. But there's an employee inside DuPont, and they stole the formula for titanium dioxide. And it sounds like some fancy national security uh, secret, but what it was, in fact, was the formula for the color white that's used in the Oreo cookie. So when I say they're stealing everything at this point, they're literally stealing the color white. And this is what uh, the former director Comey called they were, they were like a, uh, a gorilla trying to burglarize your house. This was not subtle tradecraft. People knew that it was coming from China. So when said, why did you indict it? The answer was because it's theft. And there is a norm against theft, or has been. But it's, uh, you know, it's just like the concept of an easement or customary law inside the United States. This is the idea that if you let someone walk across your lawn long enough under customary law, they earn the legal right to walk across your lawn, right, an easement. And that's why people put up no trespass signs, get off our lawn. So international law is a law of customary law. And if as long as we were continuing to keep secret, not take public, not impose consequences, and say, because you're wearing the uniform of another state, we're not going to use our criminal justice, even though if you did the exact same thing, we would consider it theft. We were creating international law in this space. And it's a space that, to date, you know, former President Obama and many others have, have called it the Wild West in some respects when it comes to cyberspace. So if we're going to start bringing the rule of law to the Wild West, it involves figuring out who did it, making it public, imposing consequences, and using our criminal justice system. Our criminal justice system alone won't solve the problem, but not using it all, I would argue, is creating the exact wrong message and creating the wrong norms for the world going forward. So for, um, f for the news today, um, should we view this as kind of a point of continuity? I mean, we hear so much about deviations in the current administration from the past administration. But is this a point of continuity, and how should we think about that? Yeah, I, I had the, uh, the uh, privilege, I think it was last week, uh, to do a talk with my successor uh, as the current Assistant Attorney General for National Security, John Demers. And one of the things uh, he was emphasizing, and I would agree, is at a time of uh, there's a fair amount of disagreement uh, <laughs> between the approaches of President Trump and President Obama. But this is an area of continuity. <laughs> So, uh, and he openly was saying that we are following the same strategy and playbook, which is dedicating the resources to figure out when we see this type of activity and when we see this type of activity, whether it's China, Russia, North Korea, or Iran, we are going to bring criminal cases. And we're also seeking to use, which we'll talk about a little bit more, an all tools approach. And when I say all tools, 
all lawfully available options. So that might include some tools that haven't been used in this space as much before, such as designating entities under Commerce Department authorities as entities who um, uh, are a threat to national security. And accordingly, you can't export certain goods to them without a license from the Commerce Department. This was a technique that was used in the prior administration against ZTE, uh, not as large as Huawei, but another very large uh, company overseas. And similarly, it was a very brazen set of facts in terms of evading the sanctions and proliferation regime that went up to the top of the company. According to public reporting as well, ZT, uh, when uh, indicted in that case, said, why are you coming after us? Huawei does it too. Um, <laughs> so there may be some historical continuity when you, see, when you build from that to the current cases against uh, Huawei. The other thing uh, in the National Security Division and space uh, it gives some comfort during this period is, again, it's the strength of the American system, but the law enforcement agents, the intelligence um, uh, officers, the trial attorneys who are prosecutors, the trial attorneys who do intelligence law, their career. Um, and they're dedicated to their jobs. They're dedicated to their mission, which is very much focused on preventing acts of terrorism inside the United States and protecting the, uh, the American system, the democratic system from threats from abroad. That's the oath they swear under the, uh, under the Constitution. And not only are they continuing to do their, to their jobs in a period of change, you know, remarkably, they were continuing to do their jobs quite well without being paid uh, for the last <laughs> month. I mean, how many countries uh, in the world would you have that without protests, which was simply uh, appalling that we can't figure out a way to pay people as they do their job uh, day to day, but they still went in working hard, working late hours in order to bring cases like the ones we saw last night. So you referenced a few minutes ago something that's happening uh, right now as we speak. It's something called the Worldwide Threat Hearing um, up on Capitol Hill before the Senate um, uh, Select Committee on Intelligence. And it's a annual event um, where the leaders of the main intelligence agencies from CIA, uh, to the FBI, to the National Security Agency, to the Director of National Intelligence, all go in a public forum and basically give their threat assessment. Now, um, I haven't uh, been able to watch the hearing because we're in here, but I'm willing to bet that at the top of their list of threats that they are going to brief Congress on today is uh, consistent with the past, I think, seven years or five or six years at least, uh, that cyber threats are going to top the list, right? It was back in, I think, 2012, when for the first time in the context of this hearing, the intelligence leaders of our government said that cyber threats have eclipsed the terrorism threat, which was, when it was said for the first time, was quite a bracing statement um, uh, post 9-11. So uh, I'm gonna go out on a limb and bet that they have placed cyber threats at the top of the list uh, again this year. What else are they, uh, do you think, telling Congress about the cyber threat? Give us your perspective on what the threat picture looks like. Uh, I think what you're, you're seeing now, and this is partly what, one of the reasons I wrote the, the book was that so many incidents have already occurred that when I was speaking, even to um, boards of directors at companies, to C-suites, they were thought were in the realm of science fiction, and they had already happened. Um, one case in particular, I know that uh, that brought home for me when, when we were in how this, why this is the top threat is, and and how it uh, challenges our current structures, systems, laws, and regulations, was one particular uh, case involving a hack inside of a U.S. company. So it's a U.S. trusted retailer, and the retailer was hacked. And the hacker stole a relatively small amount of personal information, some names, some addresses. And the way they got in, it's, uh, it was a server that was misconfigured and made publicly available for a period of time online. So bottom line is the way that the hacker got in wasn't really sophisticated. Uh, this is the type of thing that's happening to thousands and thousands of companies every day across the United States. Okay, as we speak, you know, 30 seconds in, there's probably be 100 other companies that have been hacked similarly. In this case, uh, you wouldn't expect it to be high, high risk on the part of the company. And so what happens is a couple of weeks later, they get a knock on the door, essentially someone in IT telling legal that, hey, we got a note now. 
We got an email. It's got some spelling mistakes. It has some uh, grammatical errors. But the email is saying, hey, number one, I'm, I'm mad that you threw me off your system. So let me back on uh, your system. Otherwise, I'm going to embarrass you by releasing the fact that I got into your system and stole this information. Oh, and number two, I want 500 bucks through Bitcoin. So low level, right? A lot of companies faced with that exact scenario are paying the 500 bucks. It's not a lot to pay. Or deciding we don't really care. Everyone's getting hacked these days. The last three, I think at this point, directors of the FBI had said either you've been hacked or you've been hacked and you don't know it. Um, but every company out there is facing this type of incident, so it's not that much of an embarrassment if we make it public. If the company had done that in this case, though, and didn't work with government or share information about what had occurred, what they wouldn't have known was that it wasn't the low-level hacker that it looked like. To be clear, he really did want the 500 bucks. So in some ways, he was a low-level hacker. But it was an extremist from Kosovo who had moved from Kosovo to Malaysia in part to get better access to broadband, believe it or not. He was 21, uh, 21 years old. And with a co-conspirator in Kosovo, they had hacked into this trusted brand, this retail company where you, where customers, are putting their information and stolen these names and addresses. But he also, while in Malaysia, had managed to become friends with one of the most notorious terrorists in the world at the time. And with that, let me back up a little bit, because as Lisa said, the division we both used to lead, the National Security Division, it was one of the post-September 11th reforms. So like the Director of National Intelligence, like the uh, Department of Homeland Security, these were reforms that had been put in place post-September 11th with the idea that September 11th could have been prevented that we failed to adequately share information, in particular, across the law enforcement and intelligence divide, and that that failure to share information had led to the unnecessary loss of life of thousands of people, and it was a mistake we couldn't make again. So billions of dollars, along with system reforms, these new departments and agencies, legal reforms, were put in place around that idea, we've got to do better at sharing this information. And a lot of that was focused at the time at the threat of uh, Al-Qaeda, Terrorism 1.0, where it was a model where they're trained and vetted operatives overseas in the Afghanistan, Pakistan region, in the Fatah. They closely vetted them, and then they deployed them back to try to commit a spectacular and tightly controlled uh, terrorist attack on the scale of September 11th. And the reforms worked. We got much better, and the systems and processes were set up. We were talking regularly, sharing information, incredible work by intel agents, we're working with foreign partners to disrupt those types of attacks. But as we got better and evolved and became more agile, so did the adversary. And just like Al-Qaeda took advantage of Western innovation, in that case, aviation, to turn it into a weapon, even though it does much good, we watched with Terrorism 2.0, the crowdsourcing of terrorism, the Islamic State and the Levant come up with a new idea. And here what they exploited was social media. They thought, hey, this is uh, historically uh, unprecedented. We can reach in and start having direct conversations with kids in basements inside the United States or in Europe, and we can convince them, or those who have mental issues or other issues, we can convince them to kill where they live. No travel required, no vetting. We're just going to convince them through uh, propaganda to kill uh, local targets. And we saw that work inside the United States. My last two years leading the National Security Division, we brought more international terrorism cases than we ever had before. And what we saw was, unlike what some have said, there was no particular geographic region inside the United States. It wasn't linked to ethnicity. Many of the defendants really didn't have any understanding uh, of the religious ideology they were claiming uh, to want to kill in favor of. What we saw instead was two things. One, uh, that the age of the defendants, so in 60% of the cases, the defendants were 25 or younger, and most troubling, in one-third, one-third of the cases, the defendants in international terrorism cases were 21 or younger. That has never been the case inside the federal system. In fact, we had to put out new guidance. We're just not used to even dealing with juvenile cases at all uh, federally. And the, the other reason why that was occurring, I think, the other factor that we saw in almost every single case, we saw the involvement of social media. So their strategy overseas was working. And bringing those cases may have saved lives. It was tactical success to prevent particular terrorist attacks. But it was strategic failure. 
you know, as long as they were succeeding at indoctrinating and convincing 21-year-olds or youngers to try to kill where they live, that was, that's not strategic success. And if there's one thing we should learn after September 11th, right, is that our job at the National Security Division as prosecutors was not to prosecute terrorist attacks after they occurred, but to tr figure out how to disrupt them beforehand. Afterwards, you may need to do it, but it's too late. Families are grieving and have lost loved ones. The job is to figure out how to prevent the attack. I go into this because our friend in Malaysia, and his name was Farizi, befriends Junaid Hussein, who's a British citizen who had been convicted for hacking, become radicalized in prison, joined the Islamic State in the Levant, had moved to Raqqa, Syria, and from Raqqa, Syria, using social media, he was involved in almost all, in his cadre, in almost all of the most serious terrorist plots we were seeing inside the United States. He was very good at using the English language to convince people to join the group. So Junaid Hussein, located in Raqqa, Syria, at the heart of the Islamic State of Levant, a group dedicated at the time to murdering Muslims and non-Muslims alike, that was using rape as a political tool to try to uh, cower people into submission, that was putting women and children into slavery as part of their running of a, a regime over there. Junaid Hussein befriends Farizi, the guy, the Kosovo guy in Malaysia who's hacked into this trusted US company and stolen names and addresses, and he meets, not in the real world, they never met, they become friends through Twitter. So they're meeting through direct messages, and Junaid Hussein convinces Farizi to give him that stolen customer information. And Junaid Hussein could care less about 500 bucks, right? He wants to do what the Islamic State Levant does, which is kill. So he takes that entrusted customer information, calls through it to create a kill list of looking at who looks like they might be a government employee or state employee, and then again, using social media, using Western technology provided for free, Twitter in this case, pushes that kill list back to the United States and says, kill these people by name, by address, where they live. So that was the current state of terrorism. It's the first case where we charge both computer hacking and terrorism. And if you think about it, it's five or six different countries, right, that are involved. It's moving at the speed of digital. And what makes it different as well, and this is why without the cooperation with the private company working with the government, we couldn't have taken effective action. Now, we did take effective action, which is why I can go into so many details. Farizi was arrested pursuant to U.S. process in Malaysia, extradited to the United States in Virginia, and is doing 20 years uh, in prison. And Junaid Hussein was outside the reach of law enforcement. He was killed in an openly acknowledged military strike by Central Command in Raqqa, Syria, after which uh, there were a series of strikes, after which we saw the cases inside the United States go down. So they spiked, and then they, uh, they go down. You can't, I can't say with 100% certainty that, that it's causal, but it looks like that did succeed in disrupting the threat. But that couldn't have occurred. All those institutional reforms I talked about, the creation of National Security Division, these new departments, they all were about sharing information within government and between governments. In order for the, this type of plot to be disrupted, who's on the front lines? It's not government, it's the private sector. And what we're not structured to do right now is to figure out ways to incentivize private companies to share the threat information and vulnerabilities that they're seeing. And as importantly, our whole government apparatus really isn't set up or designed to share information at scale and speed with the private sector so they can learn what the threats are and protect, uh, protect themselves. I think that's the challenge of our time. So um, you write about this case in the book, um, Dawn of the Code War, um, <laughs> that this Farisi case, you describe it as an example of what you call the blended threat, right? And I want to kind of ask you about that and, and what you mean by that and this parallel that um, to the counterterrorism um, approach that we've seen uh, both as a legal and policy matter over the last um, probably decade and a half now. Um, you, th that's another theme or thread that runs through the book that we need to be in something you and I talked about a great deal when we were in government, which is to say that we ought to, as a government, be uh, approaching and learning the lessons of what we did uh, to combat the c terrorism threat and apply those lessons to the cyber threat. 
Um, and so talk to us a little bit, is that, is that how we should be thinking about the next steps, the, the next things we need to be doing against the cyber threat? And where does that analogy break down? Yeah. So at a minimum, I think, yes, we should. So going back to um, that original People's Liberation Army case with China, it was clear even though we had with terrorism broken down the wall so that you could share information across law enforcement and intelligence, that we weren't doing the same thing when it came to cyber threats. We weren't sharing the information even within government. So that at, at the first place, you need to make sure you're sharing that information internally. Secondly, when it comes to combating terrorism threats, that's where you saw this all tools approach. There were mechanisms set up at the National Security uh, Council and in the Situation Room in order to share what you were learning on the intelligence side of the house to arm yourself with different policy uh, options so you could take action to disrupt the threat and you could take you could be creative in the way that you disrupt it so criminal justice system might be one of the tools or it might be used in combination with an executive order on sanctions with commerce department authorities with uh, with what state department is doing in terms of diplomatic uh, pushes so uh, and to make this more um, concrete, uh, so we, I talked about the Chinese PLA case. And one of the things you saw in that, uh, uh, that was not blended threat, right? So it was traditional People's Liberation Army uniformed officers. And in fact, we put an attachment at the case that showed, hey, this activity started around 9 in the morning, Beijing time. Uh, went from 9 to noon, unlike many of you. They didn't do the working lunch, apparently, because it decreased from around 12 to 1, Beijing time, <laughs> increased from 1 to 6, decreased overnight, and on Chinese holidays and weekends. So the former prosecutor and me would say, circumstantial evidence as to where this may be coming from. But also, think about it. That means it was the day job of the uniformed members of the second largest military in the world. They put the uniform, went to work each morning, got behind their uh, computer, it was to hack into private companies for the benefit of their competitors overseas. So if we treat that as a, company, as a problem for the private sector to solve, they will fail. There's no way they can compete against the resources of the second largest military of the world, which is one reason to make it a national security problem when you see what's happening on scale and figure out how the government can help, and particularly when it comes to trying to deter the activity. So we've done that case, and then how many of you, does anyone know the first destructive cyber attack on U.S. soil? First time you see malware to destroy, not steal, on U.S. soil. Any guesses? Robert Morris. <laughs> Robert Morris, yeah, that's what the case did. Isn't there a dam in upstate New York that they were able to compromise? Was it a dam as well? We'll talk about it. Any other uh, guesses? Thoughts? Interesting, because most times when I hear, uh, I've been going around talking about this, people say Sony, uh, or this, uh, the Sony Motion Pictures uh, attack, which was not uh, the first destructive attack. I'll go into that a little bit. Actually, there was an attack that was destructive. I'll talk more about the dam, which, uh, which was about gaining access to sluice control systems. But a destructive attack, malware that just wiped a system. The first destructive attack we saw was on Sands Casino. And it was after Shelly Adelson, uh, the head of Sands Casino, had made somewhat provocative remarks about something about turning Iran into a nuclear dust cloud that were not well received by the Ayatollah, <laughs> who then issued a fatwa that said uh, that called on people to commit cyber jihad, uh, and they did. So they unleashed malware against the Sands Casino that essentially turned computers into bricks. So it wiped the operating systems of the computers. And it wasn't, there was some uh, quick thinking uh, fellow in the uh, IT department, the information technology, who essentially pulled the plug, or it would have been a much more damaging uh, piece of malware as it spread across the system. Which, by the way, as I've been going around helping people design their systems, I always remind them, it's good to have in your policies something that allows the quick thinking IT person <laughs> to pull that plug, because having interviewed them after the fact, they all thought they were going to get, that happened both with uh, SANS attack and with Sony. And they had to violate policy in order to take the uh, system down. They thought they were going to get fired. But luckily, they did the right thing anyway and saved <laughs> billions of dollars of damage. So uh, I can tell you, we war-gamed out for years. What would it look like if a rogue nuclear-armed nation decides to attack the United States through cyber-enabled means 
and we all got it wrong, right? Mm -hmm. We never envisioned that they'd be attacking a gambling casino or, as happens in Sony, that they'd attack a motion, uh, motion picture over a movie. And I don't know how many of you have seen uh, that movie, the interview, but <laughs> it's about a bunch of pot-smoking reporters. Uh, it is not, uh, I had to watch it along with the director of the FBI and the Attorney General. It was one of the most surreal experiences in government at our morning threat intelligence briefing over the Christmas holidays. We're all watching this movie. Didn't make a whole lot of sense. Didn't get great reviews by that crowd, but some of you may have liked it. <laughs> it's also the only time in my career I went to the Situation Room to brief the President of the United States and started the briefing by trying to give a, a plot summary of the movie. And Awkward. You, yeah. <laughs> And that's not, uh, <laughs> the plot doesn't make a whole lot of sense, so it's not easy to summarize uh, quickly. But we did treat it like uh, a national security event. And this is where um, the lines become less clear. And some have asked, why treat that as a national security event? And I think partly it was, and it's a lesson I wish we'd learned better at the time. Um, so what, what did we see happen with the North Korean attack on Sony? Why was North Korea doing the attack? Well, just, just in that way, like I ran with Sands Casino, they were doing the attack because in North Korea, it would be illegal to insult the leader of the country. And the movie was certainly insulting and, and dealt with a fictional uh, plot by these pot-smoking reporters to assassinate uh, the leader of North Korea, so not well received. But he was seeking to impose that value here through force. So in that sense, he's attacking some, a fundamental value of the United States, right? The value, uh, the right to have free speech here and to transmit your opinion. And he's doing it through force. So if we don't respond uh, to that type of national security threat, we're going to allow other countries throughout the world to influence the a core value inside the United States. They're going to succeed, essentially, in an attack. And the other part we should have learned more about, I think, or taken um, into account was what happened with Sony. So one, just like Sands Casino, which no one, uh, when I've gone around, no one remembers that attack. It turned computers into bricks. But that's not why people remember the Sony attack. Number two, they actually stole a lot of intellectual property, pre-release movies, and released it through third-party sites. That's happened to Sony before, it's happened to many other companies, not why people remember, why it sticks in people's memory. When I go to boards, they all ask about Sony and also Target, but for different reasons. Number three, though, what they did is they, they did the thing that's easiest to do when you're a hacker. They stole salacious emails from the email uh, system about Hollywood gossip. Then they used non-mainstream press, uh, blogs, you know, WikiLeaks type sites to distribute that information. And then ironically, they watched as the mainstream media executed this attack on the First Amendment because the mainstream media pummeled Sony for what was a North Korean plot to put salacious emails uh, in, into, uh, into circulation. And I'll tell you one country I think was observing how successful that was and how easy it was to do was Russia. And so what I wish we had learned better or thought of more at the time is two things. One, we ended up sitting around the table trying to do the terrorism type approach. And Lisa was leading these meetings for, uh, for President Obama and figuring out, OK, let's go around the table like we would with a terrorist attack. What are our options? And realizing we didn't have a whole lot of options. Like people hadn't thought through. We knew about the use of the criminal justice system because we'd done it with PLA. But we didn't have an executive order in place that would allow sanctioning for cyber activity. Luckily, it was North Korea. They had done so many other bad things that there was an executive order you could use that was unique to North Korea, but that didn't seem like a good solution overall for cyber threats, and it led to the creation of an executive order that President Obama put in place. And on the continuity theme, one of President Trump's first acts was to re-sign that executive order uh, in, in, into place. We also realized we didn't have great uh, options for disruption, and we didn't have a way of collectively putting forward the intelligence uh, report the way we would with the National Counterterrorism Center when it came to terrorism. There wasn't a body that would take all the different views of the intelligence community and quickly provide them to policymakers so you could take action. So we did a lot of that ad, ad hoc. And it led, I think, uh, to in tw only 28 days figuring out it was North Korea with sufficient confidence 
that number one, so we figured out who did it. Number two, we made it public. And here, not using the criminal justice system, we used sanctions to say, to impose deterrence. And we had in an unprecedented way, the FBI state that it was North Korea without an attached criminal charge. And later, actually, uh, several years later, there now have been criminal charges that have followed and have laid out not just that North Korean activity, but their activity they've been doing in terms of bank heists. Um, where they're regularly stealing from companies, including one of the largest bank heists uh, in history, um, along with ransomware attempts. So they'll hit companies, say, pay me a certain amount of money if you want to see your data again, and they use that to raise currency for the regime. And that, uh, on the blended threat, is what we're seeing, where it's a combination of national security and criminal activity in non-traditional ways that's causing the threat. So... Um I want to open it up to questions in a few minutes, um, but first, uh, so folks be thinking about your questions that you're going to pepper John with. Um, but first, I want to ask you one more thing about the Sony uh, hack case, and then uh, get your advice for um, some of our law student friends here about public service. Um, so just on the Sony piece, you know, there was a lot of Sturm und Drang around that case and around that that um, incident where uh, folks on the Hill and in the media said, this is an act of war, we should treat it like an act of war, and we should, and some of the less sophisticated of the critics said, we should, quote, zap them back. Not sh quite sure what zapping means in that context, but um, there's a lot of debate about um, how effective we have been in deterrence Right and and very you know smart and thoughtful folks like Jack Goldsmith have questioned this um, uh, the the effectiveness of the approach you you talk about in your book. So I guess my question is a um, is it useful and should we be uh, talking about something like Sony as an act of war? And if we do, what implications does that have for um, the the steps we take in response? Yeah. Well, a couple of things. So. One on the act of war um, question, I don't think it meets the international legal definition of an act of war. So we'd be changing, uh, trying to change international law to say something like disabling, um, uh, stealing a movie company's property and knocking their computers off into space is um, the rising to the level of loss of life or property that, that would constitute an act of war. But we've also applied and this is where the Cold War, uh, uh, I think, analogy comes in, and why I call the book Dawn of the Code War. In a way, it's, it's not a traditional war, but it needs the attention, resources, and treatment as a national security threat as a conventional war would. But that doesn't mean that um, you know, if, if uh, you get an attack that costs a trade secret, that you respond with kinetic action. Um, in other words, armed force against the adversary overseas. It does mean, though, that you need a strategy that looks across, and this is where it's so important for uh, those of you in the law, to think through what are the range, how can we combine what we can do legally and through di diplomatic action to raise the costs to change or deter the behavior. And I agree, we haven't done enough, but we weren't doing anything at all. Mm -hmm. um, for a period of time. We were literally keeping it secret. It wasn't, I think it was only in 2011 as a government official, I was allowed to say that China commits economic espionage. Uh, it was classified otherwise. Uh, people knew it uh, who were in the company, but I couldn't say it uh, as a government uh, official. So if we're going to fix the problem and raise the costs, we need to switch to a default of keeping it secret, to a default of talking about it publicly and sharing, which is one of the reasons uh, when so much detail in the book, sharing the details in the stories. Number one, they're incredible stories. But number two, that arms our private sector, it arms our policymakers, and it arms the public to demand a change and put pressure on the government to take action to confront and change the behavior of these uh, nation states. With Sony, the act of war is kind of interesting. One of the uh, stories uh, as well is for those practicing at home uh, and advising companies, there's an act of uh, war uh, insurance exclusion <laughs> in most insurance policies, and Sony had insurance. And actually, there's a case going on now <clears throat> dealing with a Russian um, uh, malware called NotPetya that was unleashed in Ukraine and then spread indiscriminately across the world, causing 
Uh, Maersk shipping, $500 million worth of damage. FedEx, $300 million worth of damage, along with hitting companies uh, throughout the world. One of the companies seeking to get insurance coverage, the insurer is uh, battling them in court, saying this wasn't this purported to be ransomware, but there was no way to pay it. So it really was an act of war uh, above Russia against Ukraine. So we don't need to pay out on our insurance policies. <laughs> so for the practitioners, I don't think that would be great policy. And most insurance <laughs> policy, cyber insurance, wouldn't be, given how many of these threats are national security, you want to make sure that you're covered. Um, and that act of war is, it meets more with the traditional international legal. It's one of those rare, so Sony had reached out to us. It was one of the points we made uh, kind of on their behalf around the table in terms of how, how to characterize it. I don't think it was ultimately uh, dispositive as to why the President of the United States called it. I believe he called it a cyber act of vandalism. Yeah. And one of the stories I tell in the and book. And got roundly <laughs> criticized, criticized for that. So. Uh, was uh, Michael Hayden, the former head of CIA and NSA, yeah. said he heard that and he was just outraged. He was so mad that they, uh, how can you not call this uh, war. And then he started thinking about it more, and he's like, well, it's not war, yep. but I don't like cyber active vandalism, and I'm not exactly sure what I would call it, uh, as he thought about it more. So I, I think it's in a realm where we should apply the lessons we did with terrorism or the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, which is you can use all the tools of national security, you can call it a national security threat, even though it falls below uh, the threshold of armed conflict. And I think there's been way too much attention in, uh, for scholars in this space on the armed conflict question when it comes to cyber law, which is not taking into account what we're actually seeing day to day. And it would be great if there was more attention to, OK, if it does not meet the international definition of war, our armed conflict are, what are the other legal tools and what should we be exploring as ways to change behavior? A lot of work to be done in that space, and I'm not seeing as much scholarship in that space. It would be great to see. Great. Um, very, very quickly, I uh, want to get your advice to budding law students, or current law students, but budding public uh, service folks. I get a lot of questions, um, I'm, and I know you do. You spent uh, your career in public service, now in the private sector for the first time. But it used to be that the evaluation from law students was crushing debt uh, if I go into public service or go to the private sector. Now there's other, I'm hearing more and more other considerations, um, not just the economic ones, about going into public service. People um, having other, other concerns about going into government these days. What's your advice uh, to, to students contemplating that? What type of concerns? About you know, whether or not they want to be part of, of, uh, of a um, government where they may disagree with some of the steps the government is taking. Well, and maybe that brings us back to where, uh, where we started. So first, uh, unequivocally, I loved, uh, just in terms of your satisfaction day to day, I loved every job that I had in, uh, in government, whether it was a uh, line prosecutor doing domestic violence cases, working criminal, uh, I didn't love every minute of every day, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, criminal tax, working at the FBI, it was, it's an amazing set of experience and part of that is you're getting up each day driven by, uh, by mission. And it, that phrase gets repeated a lot in a way that it, it, sometimes I think it uh, empties out a meaning and, meaning and you don't really hear it. But when I was going around just talking to former colleagues at the FBI, in other words, there's no better kind of uh, demonstration of that. It's, it's low pay normally, but it's not no pay. But they were still getting up uh, excited to do their mission of protecting not just the, the United States as a nation, but more importantly, what we stand for. Mm -hmm. So protecting the rule of law, protecting our constitutional uh, democracy. And it's just to be able to go up and know that, that that's your mission uh, is, is an amazing feeling. And in terms of going in now, uh, and that's where we started, even in this period of great churn, where there's a lot of attacks on those institutions from our own political system, there are still thousands and thousands of people, whether, uh, and there's all sorts of different parts of the government. I'm more, uh, my background was in law enforcement, national security, who are, are doing their job and they don't, they don't care about what's going on um, in the political ethosphere. You go in and you solve problems. Solve problems in a way that helps people, whether uh, you know, it's helping someone with education, helping someone get justice uh, through the criminal justice system who's traditionally been 
ignored. And those jobs uh, continue. So you might want to be careful, depending on, on your views about where uh, in the government you, you go. But there are many places where you can go in as a career professional and serve through uh, mul multiple administrations. So even though I'm supposed to recruit now in, uh, in the private sector, and if you don't, I'll still try to recruit you. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I can't. Uh, I couldn't deter anyone from going into government. We need people who care about these issues now. I agree with that. Um, OK, let's open it up to questions. And folks, um, just raise your hand if you've got a question for John. And remember, there's a mic here that you can use. Randy Milch. John, thanks very much for coming. It's a, I look forward to reading Dawn of the Code War, <laughs> available now for sale. Um, one of the things that you, uh, this is really two questions. The first is in your litany of the reasons that we should uh, go after uh, malfactors through, through legal processes like you know, through the criminal process, you repeated every time you went through the litany, you said, and there should be consequences. So it's, I think it's, um, I'm interested in your view of the consequences. Uh, you raised the prospect of, uh, uh, of sanctions, but that may not be operative in every instance. Um, particularly if it's simply, simply the, the theft of intellectual property. I'm not sure that the color white is a national security problem. Um, so what are the consequences for indicting people who will never come to justice in the United States? The second question is uh, your uh, concern over the absence of information and information sharing from the pri private sector into the government in particular. Um, I think if, as you well know, the history of this is that for since at least the Clinton administration, we've been trying to offer private industry carrots for giving in various types of information. We've studiously avoided any sticks uh, in the provision of information. Do you think it's time for some sticks to force the provision of information? Uh, and do you think it's possible to ever pass sticks through Congress given the unseemly food fight that, that accompanied the, you know, the Information Sharing Act, which really didn't do that much? But it was like it was a it was a social arm it was a you know legislative Armageddon almost to try to get that passed. So those two questions. No, uh, thanks, Randy. So uh, on the first, in terms of consequences, one I think for too, for too long we took the criminal justice system off the table, and when we first brought the case against the PLA, people said this is just a name and shame approach. One element, I think, and this goes again to the strength of the United States, is that uh, our, our criminal justice system has more credibility around the world than, than any other, in part because it's, of how long it's operated independently. So knowing that there's an indictment, which means you're able uh, and could prove beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury uh, with admissible evidence your charges, is a powerful statement of what, and going into detail with it in a speaking indictment, is a powerful statement that allows private companies and multinational uh, corporations or countries around the world to change the way they think about the threat um, and demand uh, action. And it also can lead other, uh, other countries, their national policymakers, to change the way that they're dealing with these issues. So, and I think you've seen that when it there's been a shift when it comes to uh, China and the Huawei case, um, cases that I talked about today are a particularly relevant current example where Huawei was dominantly doing business around the world and now you're seeing Australia, New Zealand, you just saw uh, Poland arrest an intelligence operative operating under cover of Huawei, then say it was directed uh, by Huawei who is inside their country. You're seeing Canadian act on, uh, Canada act on U.S. charges. You're seeing Japan, the United Kingdom, uh, Germany uh, start to reassess whether they'll do business with uh, Huawei. Vodafone just changed its policy. Verizon, a uh, company some people here might be familiar with, uh, <laughs> AT&T wouldn't use Huawei, Huawei devices. So these are real commercial consequences for the company that started with this uh, approach in criminal justice. The other thing with criminal uh, justice system as a tool is it's not name and shame. And one of the stories I tell in the book that uh, hadn't really been told before, and because the timing was, while we were taking the maximum amount of flack uh, saying you're not going to, uh, it is unlikely China will extradite the, uh, their, their own military unit, <laughs> which was true, uh, we had arrested a Chinese intelligence operative who had hacked into Boeing named Su Bin. And 
which uh, is newly relevant with today's. He actually had been arrested in Canada uh, <laughs> pursuant to extradition. And this, again, is a playbook that we're seeing repeated. In fact, in response, China arrested two, two Canadian coffee shop owners and accused them of being spies and said they wouldn't release them unless Canada released Su Bin um, and brought him to the United States. We didn't talk about it because we didn't want to negatively impact the extradition proceeding, and reporters just didn't pick up on it. So it was unknown that Su Bin had been uh, arrested. China knew it, and I think it's partly why, along with sanctions and the other case, that, uh, the PLA case, that they met, uh, President Xi met with President Obama and agreed to an unprecedented new norm, new deal that said, we will not use our military and intelligence to target private companies for private gain. And remarkably, and I was somewhat cynical at the time, whether they would live by it, we saw a big decrease in the activity right around that norm. We saw it in government, private sector saw it, third parties saw it. So it had real concrete effect that uh, for thousands and thousands of companies, you stopped doing the theft. That agreement seems to be over. And I think that's partly because with the new administration, it was unclear what, that, what the norm was, that they're, what the benefit was of the deal that they had uh, uh, struck. In terms of the other tools, you just saw with Micron, with the victim of intellectual property, the administration designate through the Commerce Department, uh, it, the Chinese company that benefited from the theft overseas. That had real consequences to the company and brought them to the table. So that may be one of the tools to consider. The executive order on sanctions um, that a former, uh, one commentator, Stuart Baker, would call the April Fool's Day uh, order because it was passed on, uh, signed on April 1st and then it wasn't used. <laughs> In fact, the first time it was used was against uh, Russians for their activities related to the election and criminal activities but that was three months after the, uh, or two and a half months after the election, roughly mm -hmm. in December of that year. At the end of the Obama administration. We haven't seen it used against China ever, um, even though they're laying out in meticulous detail what partic where particular companies have gained. So that might be another one to um, explore. On the information sharing, I, I do think we need to reconsider the, the carrots and sticks. I. I I think there are some sticks, you know, it's, but they're not calibrated in order to incentivize companies to share the information w with the agencies who need it most for law enforcement and national security. So you're seeing around privacy a uh, regime that causes people, companies to produce information at harm to the company. But I don't know about you, I get those notices, and I've actually you know, spent my whole career in this space, uh, basically, and I don't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. uh, so my daughter, I think her first piece of mail was telling her that her identity had been stolen in the Office of Personnel Management uh, hack. Not a lot of, uh, you know, that the four-year-old is going to do with that letter that they receive. Mm -hmm. It doesn't require you to go in and tell uh, the law enforcement or other agencies. So I think we need to, to review what our system of incentives is to, to maximize sharing. And as to whether or not that can be done uh, through, through Congress, I, I leave that uh, to others. But it's one thing I know we're working on in the, in the Aspen group. And what I hope is, unlike September 11th, that we can create enough of a drumbeat about the, the scope and size of the problem now so we can institute some of those reforms. Otherwise, I still think they will be instituted. It will be after we suffer some really shocking uh, event, either to our economy or one that causes loss of life. I think we have learned that uh, if you're a malicious cyber actor or a Chinese executive under um, investigation, you should not travel through Canada. <laughs> um, all right, we've got time for one or two more questions, and I'll ask John to um, try and uh, keep his answers Sorry. brief so we can get as many questions in. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. So how concerned are you and other cyber experts about a coordinated attack on our financial system, on our major financial institutions? And can you say a few words of what's being done to prevent it, and is it enough, in your view? I'm to keep it short. So one, very. Mm -hmm. um, and we've already seen, a uh, gentleman before asked about it, a, a distributed denial of service attack. So hundreds of thousands of computers turned into essentially a cyber weapon of mass destruction, a botnet that attacked 47 different financial institutions that were linked to the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps when we were going through a churn in relations in the prior administration. It affected tens of thousands of customers, cost um, uh, millions of dollars to, to remediate. 
In terms of what's being done, I'd actually say the financial sector has moved further and faster than any other sector, maybe because they have the funds to do it, but including our electrical grid or others to not just try to harden the system, but make it resilient and have pristine copies of the data so that if there was someone altered the integrity or denied access to it, that we wouldn't lose confidence in our trading market. And that focus on resilience is a program called ARC. Uh, I think is instructive for other sectors to follow. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, so attribution can be very difficult in the cyberspace, and sometimes you can get to 90% attribution but not 100%. Uh, how does that affect your ability to prosecute cases? Sure. Uh, and one of the reasons we're doing this, a attribution is hard, but not impossible. And we were much better at it than people thought, but we kept it secret. And it's one reason I go into so many different cases where we successfully did attribution, not just to the, the nation or the particular group, but by name, by face, with photograph of who was behind the keyboard. And I, and I think changing the world's view that you can do this with impunity and you'll never be caught is important to changing policy in this space. I met... Uh, I met one guy who used to work for CNN uh, uh, as an intern, and now is a reporter for ABC. But he was telling me the story of, if you go to CNN now and they talk about hacking, you're going to see a pair of fingers on the keyboard, and it's his fingers. Um, <laughs> they've been using the same B-roll for something like 15 years. Um, and so one of the things is, it's not you know, changing the view that it's not anonymous fingers on a keyboard. There's a body behind it. We can figure out who that is, and that helps with uh, deterring the activity. Uh, yes, sir. The uh, last question uh, really talked about the functional efficiency of law. And um, I want to ask a similar question in terms of, you've described uh, a systemic fragility that we are suffering from, which is caused by tech technological complexity and particularly highlighted by the speed of occurrence and the difficulty of responding in time. Now, the law has certain preemptive or proactive uh, types of legal remedies like injunctions and seizure, self-defense, particularly, uh, I want to say, the antitrust per se, where certain things are automatically illegal if you do them. What kind of legal tools can you think of for the 21st century that would be preemptive and that would help us in terms of dealing with this kind of a threat? So we do, we do, Stephen Brill in his book, Tailspin, invites due process as slowing the response of law. It makes the response of law ineffective because it takes so long. Mm -hmm. How do we come up with something legal that <coughs> propels the rule of law, but yet is fast enough to deal with this kind? No, I think it's a great question, and, I, and in that sense, the, the criminal, uh, there's a reason why, for instance, with North Korea and Sony, we use sanctions. It's, it, it's a faster process. Um, it's ultimately a, a policy tool, although it has a legal basis, and you can use classified information without fear that it's going to be disclosed in a courtroom, so it's a lower burden. The criminal justice system, I think, helps anchor what we're doing in fact and law in a way that's credible that then can help lead and support the use of other tools. Uh, but the standards are much lower for, for instance, that Commerce uh, Department authority for sanctions, for bringing a, a, a trade suit. So those are areas we might explore. On the preemptive side or uh, injunctive, I mean, another area to explore would be, and you saw uh, this approach with a uh, Russian cybersecurity company um, where the government banned its use and then put out publicly that they had banned the use of the tool. This is Kaspersky. And then they got sued. Um, so one area of legal reform might be to allow the government to publicly talk about uh, uh, where they're seeing the threats. That would affect at least people's commercial um, activity and could deter some, some of that space. Um, I think that's all we have time for. I really want to thank John for being with us today and giving us his insights. Uh, and thank you all uh, for coming out. Really appreciate it. Thank you.